members Moya and Diaz. Uh, anyone else? All right, Sergeant, so uh, we're going to start the recording. Uh, PC recording is underway. Our recording. Backup right. is rolling. Sergeant Leonardo, I will leave it to you. City Council remote hearing for the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on their video for verification purposes. Please put any cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate to minimize disruptions throughout the hearing. If you have testimony that you wish to submit for the record, you can do so by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Mr. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing. Uh, I am Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer, Chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations, and we are now formally in session. I want to acknowledge that we are joined by Council Member Francisco Moya and Council Member Dharma Diaz of the committee, and I will announce the additional members as they arrive to participate in this important hearing. Of course, we're joined by Commissioner Gonzalo Casals from the Department of Cultural Affairs, and we look forward to hearing his testimony very soon. Today, we're addressing a very important topic, the impact of COVID-19 on New York City's artists and the perspective of working artists during the pandemic. This is our third COVID related hearing since the pandemic hit. On June 22nd, we held a hearing on DCLA, COVID-19 and cultural organizations in New York City. And on December 15th, we talked about the impact of COVID-19 on art and cultural education, no programming in New York City. Uh, all the while, of course, we uh, pushed and were able to pass the open culture legislation that I believe will be so helpful uh, to so many. But the testimony from these hearings tell a story. We know that during the first months of the pandemic, 95% of art and cultural institutions in New York City either canceled programs uh, with 88% uh, modifying the delivery of their programs. Uh, and uh, at least 11% were rendered unable to provide any uh, services. Uh, the performing arts industry lost 70% of its jobs due to closures, while a number of performance and cultural venues, uh, including the Creek and the Cave, a place that I loved very dearly, have gone out of business altogether. These are not the only casualties. We know that while organizations suffer, the city's artists themselves uh, largely bore the brunt of staffing cuts uh, and reductions in programs and services. Uh, even before the pandemic, nearly 11% of artists in New York City uh, lived below the poverty line. And as testimony from these previous hearings has stressed, artists are workers. I'll repeat that, artists are workers. They bring revenue and value to our city. Uh, their work needs to be valued and prioritized. Yet since the pandemic hit, our city's artists and, performance and performers, including DJs, arts educators, costume makers, musicians, comedians, um, too many have been left out uh, in the cold. Uh, we rightly focused on restaurants, uh, but society uh, wrongly has focused on bailing out large corporations uh, while we have not nearly done enough for working people, which includes, of course, our artists and cultural community. Today, we want to hear from the artists. Uh, and what is the reality of being an artist in New York City today? Uh, what do artists need the most from this city? Uh, 
what has been helpful, what has been not. Uh, again, we know this pandemic has exacerbated issues uh, for many artists that have existed for some time. Um, but uh, while many entered the year uh, with a clear schedule of paid work, um, though only to see uh, income disappear and spend a couple of weeks. But of course, we know that many artists did not even begin the year with a clear schedule of paid work. Um, artists bring incredible revenue to the city of New York, uh, but so much more. Looking forward, it's important to mention that while we absolutely need more investment in the arts and artists, uh, since March, we've seen artists advocating for themselves in new and dynamic ways, uh, building power uh, through uh, coalitions, grassroots funding and organizing, uh, and the Culture at Three call the Music Workers Alliance. There's so many other examples of artists uh, building power. Uh, that is something that I hope continues well beyond uh, the moment that we are all in. Today, in addition to hearing of, about and from artists, uh, we're also considering two pieces of legislation. The intro 2194 uh, related to requiring the Department of Cultural Affairs to study the real estate issues impacting cultural spaces and intro 2195 related to certification of artists and the issuance of identity cards uh, for certified artists. Uh, while 2194 in particular addresses uh, commercial buildings, I am happy that we are addressing real estate and the arts. We know rent is often uh, the largest expense uh, for artists and cultural venues, uh, and artists have stressed um, that the New York State eviction moratorium uh, that ended uh, last summer was not enough time, uh, and also stressed that it needs to be property tax relief um, for that would be very helpful uh, to cultural venues and artists. We welcome this feedback and more. Uh, the legislation being heard today uh, are uh, just part of the work that this committee has done along with open culture and uh, along with the uh, budgetary issues and the hearings we've held uh, to addressing the concerns um, of artists, uh, particularly during this uh, impossible, impossible time. Um, I look forward to hearing more about um, the state of the arts and artists uh, from the artists themselves. Um, and of course, we will uh, also hear from uh, Commissioner Casals uh, with the Department of Cultural Affairs um, view on all of this, including uh, comments on the two proposed pieces of legislation. Again, I wanna thank all of you. Uh, we have spent a lot of time together uh, over the last uh, 11 <laughs> plus years but in particular during the pandemic um, uh, in so many uh, Zoom calls and, and meetings, um, whether it's Culture at Three or uh, all of the meetings around open culture. And, and I wanna thank all of you for your, your fight uh, on behalf of uh, the cultural community artists and uh, the city, which would be nothing without artists and uh, the cultural community. So thank you. Um, I wanna, uh, before I, I turn this over back to uh, our committee council, thank uh, my legislative director, Jack Bernadovitz, who's also um, our, our cultural liaison um, and who's done incredible work with the um, cultural community. And I know has been a constant presence at the Culture Three calls and was really, really, helpful uh, in the open culture um, legislative fight. Uh, and I just wanna thank uh, uh, Jack, uh, my chief of staff, Matt Wallace, um, and of course our um, committee uh, counsel, Brenda McKinney, who I will soon toss this to, but who worked uh, 
uh, incredibly hard on the Open Culture Bill as well. Uh, Christy Dwyer, our policy analyst, uh, who is here, and Alia Ali, who is our principal financial analyst for this committee. Uh, so with that, thank you all. I hand it over to uh, Brenda McKinney to issue the oath uh, and give everyone all of the appropriate instructions on how we're going to proceed with this hearing. Brenda. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, so we will start with going over some procedures and then move to the oath and the administration. So I am Brenda McKinney, counsel to the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries and International Intergroup Relations at the New York City Council. I am moderating today's hearing and I will be calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. A box will pop up asking you to accept it. Just a note that you will need to accept that to be unmuted. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the, who the next panelist will be by panel. Council members, questions will be limited today to five minutes. And council members, please also note this includes both your questions and the witness answers. Please also note that we will not be allowing a second round of questions at today's hearing. For public uh, testimony and for members of the public, I will call up individuals in panels. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and you'll be called on after everyone on the full panel has been called on to testify um, and completed their testimony. For public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. So you can begin after the clock is set and remember that when you are unmuted, a box will pop up asking you to accept the unmute. After public testimony um, or all public testimony today will be limited to a two minute clock, two minutes. After I call your name, Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. So at this point, we will begin with administration testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. First, uh, Gonzalo Casals, the Honorable Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner, the Department of Cultural Affairs, and Sheila Feinberg, Deputy Commissioner at the, De uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs. I will deliver the, both, the oath to both of you and after I will call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. Um, so if you can please raise your right hand in Zoom. Thank you so much. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions today? Commissioner Casals? I do. Thank you so much. And Deputy Commissioner Feinberg? I do. Thank you. Uh, so with this, uh, Commissioner Casals, you may begin your testimony when ready. Uh, Brenda, can I just, uh, Commissioner Casals, before you testify, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Mark Jonai as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I start my testimony, um, Chair Van Bremer, we've known each other for many years, so I want to get a little personal here. I want to wish your mother a happy birthday, Elizabeth. Um, I'm, I know. Um, Thank she'll you. Be, we'll be celebrating later. Um, yes. No problem. <laughs> <clears throat> Good morning, Chair Van Bremer and members of the committee. I'm Gonzalo Casals, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, here to testify in regards to today's topic. I'm joined today by the Deputy Commissioner Sheila Feinberg. No corner of New York City has been untouched by the pandemic. Collectively, we'll be addressing the fallout from the public health crisis, the loss of life, and the economic devastation for many years to come. While, and while the glaring racial injustices that have been magnified by COVID-19 have been with us for generations, I also hope that the willingness to address these issues openly and to make real structural change will drive everything that we do in the years ahead. Much of the same can be said about our cultural community and the artists who work within it. Culture is woven into our city's neighborhoods and naturally cultural groups and artists have suffered alongside their neighbors. They have struggled to stay healthy, 
to help their communities and in often quietly heroic ways to keep producing work that engages with the current moment. Art can help us make sense of a chaotic wor world to come together and envision new futures. New York wouldn't be the vibrant place that it is without the artists who have lived and worked here for generations. And to have art and cultural programming that responds to our experiences in engaging potent ways, we need artists living and working in New York City. One powerful example of the essential role of artists play in our city and community life is the city's public artists in residency program known as PER. For this year programs, the artists work with agencies is reckoning with the pandemic in inspiring ways. One of the pair artists working with the Commission on Human Rights, Amanda Pindo Paki, I'm sorry, Amanda Pindo Di, Di Pakia, um, created, I, created I Still Believe in Our City, a campaign to address the anti-Asian and Pacific Islander and anti-Black racism that the pandemic laid bare. The ongoing campaign kick off with a takeover of Atlantic Avenue Terminal in Brooklyn, presenting passengers with images of their um, Asian Pacific Islander and black neighbors with simple messages that face our problems head on. And I quote, I'm not your scapegoat, end quote. And Black Lives Matter, to name just two. We need art and artists as much as ever, while they're simultaneously facing incredible challenges alongside all New Yorkers. Over nearly a year of numerous conversations, observations, and surveys, we know that artists here in New York have been affected in profound ways that we're still working to fully understand. The Department of Cultural Affairs conducted a survey of the cultural community last spring. It captured the earliest weeks of the pandemic. Even then, the effects of, on artists were alarming. Artists employed by cultural groups bore the brunt of layoffs. Art, arts education organizations collectively reported decreases of over 2,100 2, artists or 75% of artists staffing during this period. Other reports from around the same time produced dire findings. Brooklyn Arts Council survey found that 80% of artists say they were experiencing cash flow issues just weeks into the pandemic. The Center for Urban Futures report that art in a time of um, coronavirus similarly found that working artists had lost up to um, a third of their annual income just a month after the lockdowns began. These figures don't even touch um, the physical and emotional toll the pandemic has, even, has taken on um, everyone, including artists. Thanks to our partnership with the City Council, the de Blasio Administration and the Department of Cultural Affairs have worked to support the city's cultural community despite the bleak financial outlook. While the agency budget is down from its record height last year, it represents a robust investment by historical standards. Just last month, based on the findings of our spring survey, we partnered with the Arts Education Roundtable to set aside funds specifically to support arts educators. We also earmark additional funds for arts groups in and serving communities hardest hit by COVID-19 and increase the funding for the five local art councils, our longtime partners in providing funds directly to artists doing the public programming in all five boroughs. But we can't do this alone. We know that the need is far too great. Private philanthropy has also been a key partner. Through our survey and collected advocacy along the mayor's office of media and entertainment, New York City and company and others, we have also pushed at the state of the federal, at the state and the federal levels for the support of city cultural community needs. The most recent stimulus bill included $15 billion for Save Our Stages. This is an astounding achievement and we can and what we can accomplish together when we speak with a unified voice in advocating for the important role cultural plays in our econ economy and our communities. And I applaud all of our colleagues in the cultural community for fighting to make this happen. With a new administration taking the federal government, we'll need to continue to operate in this collaborative, creative, constructive way for the relief funding that we need and deserve. We appreciate the council's leadership and advocacy for New York's cultural community too. We're already deeply engaged in working on the open culture program. We look forward to this program bring city streets to life while giving artists and arts groups opportunities to raise much needed revenue later this spring. 
Regarding the legislations being presented in today's hearing, we're always happy to work with the city council and cultural advocates on proposals that support artists in New York City. While we have some reservations about cost, timeline, and implementation of this process proposed legislation, we look forward to discussing and working with you further. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Casals. Um, <clears throat> and uh, maybe you could, because this is all about listening to artists and, and making sure that uh, and people like you and I have an open line of communication uh, to the people that we represent. And I think I know that you and I both feel very strongly that uh, uh, our, our constituency are artists and, and cultural organizations. Um, so talk to me a little bit about how the department um, is communicating with artists right now, right? And, and, and receiving from artists and, uh, and cultural workers and music workers, their, their needs and priorities. Like how are you interfacing with, with the artists and, and making sure that, that, that you and the department and therefore um, as the primary representative of the mayor to this community, that, that artists are being heard um, in terms of where they're at right now? So um, thank you for that question. Um, there's uh, two main ways in which I'm personally doing this. Um, you know, one is of course, you know, the survey that we did in the spring, we're getting ready to do a second survey um, starting very soon in a couple of weeks. Um, the survey is going to be in collaboration with the um, New York Community Trust um, and also with the art um, councils um, in the five boroughs because um, while we want to follow up in the results that we, um, we got on the first survey in the spring, at the same time we want to expand um, a little bit you know, um, the, um, the respondents. And in that, um, by collaborating with the councils and by collab collaborating with the New York Community Trust, we're going to be able to capture um, a universe that usually is not touched directly by the agency um, because of um, eligibility for funding. And in that universe are artists and non-incorporated organizations, artist collectives. So that's going to be a way in which we're going to get um, a little closer to um, understanding the reality of um, these um, individuals. Um, at the same time, um, since I took over this position seven months ago, I had been doing um, many of them um, on a weekly basis, um, list, what we call listening sessions, in which um, we get together with groups and we just sit and listen and understand where their needs are, where the priorities of the agency should be. And we have done this not only with cultural organizations, but also with um, um, groups of, um, of artists. Um, recently, we have sat, um, and I think you and I miss each other for a week. Um, we sat with um, a New York, New York um, Dance NYC to really listen to um, where the realities are and how we can work together. And that's an example of um, many. Yes, no, I think uh, uh, we can't be on enough. Uh, uh, Zoom calls and uh, enough <laughs> events where we're with artists, um, uh, including uh, Music Workers Alliance, Dance NYC, Culture Three, uh, League of Independent Theaters. Uh, those are all some of the uh, uh, constituencies that I've sat down with. Um, I do think, uh, as was mentioned to me by someone who's in the room, uh, when you are doing the survey, it uh, probably would be good to ask all of your grantees to send them send it out to all the artists that they work with uh, and, uh, and to, to get an even deeper uh, dive and broader swath uh, of respondents. Uh, I do see we've been joined by Majority Leader Kumbo. I wanna recognize uh, um, Majority Leader Kumbo with us uh, and uh, uh, I'll mention any other uh, colleagues on the committee uh, who join us. Uh, and maybe you can give us a little update on open culture. Uh, you, you mentioned it. I know I was uh, uh, on a call with uh, uh, several agencies as we're starting to work through that, but uh, maybe from your perspective, you can give everyone here an update on uh, 
where you see it going or how you see it going? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of excitement to um, to just um, for for open culture to to happen. Um, I believe it's going to be not later than um, early March. Um, there's some um, group across agencies and working with the city council to fine tune um, the processes on how that's gonna work. And I look forward to um, very soon um, to announce um, what those details are going to be. Uh, great. Um, we certainly are engaged in that work and, and I know everyone's anxious to hear. Uh, where what the next steps are and and uh, and how folks can uh, start to uh, actually access the application and plan um, events and uh, and uh, of course there's some outstanding questions with respect to the uh, the application that we need to get back to folks on um, so I, I know in your uh, testimony you were you were uh, Express some concerns on behalf of the administration, um, as uh, you are required to do. Um, but can you can you talk to twenty one ninety four, and and certainly feel free to share any concerns the administration might have, but also just talk about uh, your understanding of the real estate. Uh, pressures that that many of our, our cultural organizations face, right? Either those that, that have their own space, whether they rent or own, or of course, many uh, of our organizations and artists do not have a, a permanent home, but are um, continually moving about and, and in desperate need of uh, affordable space for either rehearsal or performance. Um, so talk a little bit about your your view about how real estate uh, plays a role in impacting uh, how art is created, who can create it, and 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 who can participate in it. You know, um, in answering that question, I'm going to bring you back to um, the days in which I was working as a consultant for this agency uh, for the cultural plan. And I was on the one of the many, many, many um, um, hearing sessions and listening sessions that we did. Um, and there was one in particular and we did with artists in which the facilitator says, you know, where are the things that you need to thrive as an artist, right? You know, and there was a list of them. Um, studio space, you know, time, you name it. And then there was a the question, where are the things that you need to um, survive as an artist, right? An affordable um, rent, you know, <laughs> um, a health insurance, you know, a job, you know, that pays. Um, so a lot of these issues and including the real estate issue, not only for working, but also for living space for artists had been um, an issue for the uh, sector for many, many, many years, if not decades. Um, as I understand, as, as we all see the city becoming more and more expensive um, to live, um, the, um, the, um, what we are looking into do is to add um, to this survey, to add a few questions that would um, help us understand, you know, how um, COVID has affected this issue um, a, a little more than, you know, than usual. Um, but I were hoping that um, just to um, do our um, COVID survey first before we engage in the creation of a new report, just because of um, um, financial and staffing um, resources. And, and with respect to uh, the specific piece of, of legislation 2194, uh, this is our first hearing on the issue. And of course, we're going to hear from the community uh, itself on 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 these issues and the legislation but uh, do you have any ideas on uh, not just the concerns but ideas on on how it could be made better or um uh, what what is uh, missing um as we start this this discussion on on 2194 
I think it's a, it's an issue that we should address uh, head on. Um, you know, the question, as I said, you know, my um, on my um, testimony, it's it's an issue of timing and resources. Um, I think we should definitely, um, um, you know, data. A government works based on data. We should definitely try to connect either through um, a, a, a sort of a report like the one that you're proposing, or in other formats, and um, collect, understand collectively um, the impact of um, raising real estate um, values um, in our cultural sector. Yeah, and I, I, I know you feel this and know this, uh, but there is obviously a sense of urgency uh, because we have already lost uh, so many spaces. So many spaces are, are holding on, right? Literally uh, uh, just trying to survive. Um, and of course, there are so many issues around equity, right? And uh, uh, which communities have access and which, communities do not, and we know um, the answers to those questions. Um, do you wanna speak uh, uh, briefly to 2195 and the, the idea around uh, certification of artists and uh, uh, the issuing of, of uh, uh, a card that would allow artists to uh, have a, a, a source of identity around that? Yes, I think that's um, a great idea. Again, you know, what I would like us to spend some time to figure out um, how we do not reinvent the wheel. In a moment of uh, the city is experiencing one of its um, biggest uh, financial crises. I, I just, it gives me a pause to create yet another process um, that needs um, staffing and, and resources to support. I think there might be um, already um, ways in which this is happening um, in other communities and how that could be um, sort of um, mimic or even added to that. And then um, the one thing is that, well, I understand the, um, the um, um, spirit of um, this designation. Um, again, there are a couple of things that, I, uh, that just also give me pause and we would just, you know, working with the um, advocates and with the city council, we need to refine is sometimes it makes me anxious to, um, um, to give the power to the government to decide who's an artist and who's not. Um, so, you know, ideas of certification, ideas of registration by, you know, one, um, you know, by government, um, we should be careful, you know, what that looks like and, and how it sounds. And two is, um, I understand that this is, um, in, in, is the first step in trying to prepare artists to um, receive benefits from the government. Usually um, it works the other way around, you know, a benefit is created and then is defined, you know, how artists could, um, I mean, artists or whoever the benefit is, whoever is receiving the benefit, you know, how they become eligible. Um, while I'm not opposed to um, just turn the process around, I just want us to understand a little bit the expectations, right? I just don't want to create a, a, a process um, half of a process in which um, leaves, uh, creates expectations for artists and then um, nothing is um, happening. Yeah, but um, no, I think, I think you we know are. Me, oh. you know, I'm, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was sure. just saying that you know me and, and you know we, we will be um, happy to collaborate and figure out you know, a, a way to um, continue to support um, artists and cultural organizations. Yes. Uh, we're we're both in agreement uh, that we certainly don't want any of those potential negative consequences to occur. But uh, that that uh, idea really came from from artists and and advocates. So interested to see how we can um, both accomplish the goal and not have any of those uh, potentially negative uh, consequences uh, result. I would ask uh, our committee council at this point if there are any other. Uh, council members who have questions for Commissioner Casals on the topic or the legislation. Thank you, Chair Van Bremer. We, I don't see any hands raised. Just a reminder that if any council I members- I see the majority leader's hand right, wrote. <laughs> the majority leader has your hand clearly, clearly arisen. So in, um, in Zoom, so we will go to Majority Leader Combo. Apologies. Yes. Okay. 
I apologize. My uh, my son's daycare was shut down for COVID today, so I'm trying to balance a lot of things. Um, Commissioner, I just wanted to reiterate or to uh, just state the importance of the open culture program, because as you know, so many organizations, so many organizations are applying for their are applying for their DCLA funding as we speak, and so in order for those applications to potentially use that um, as the basis for their grant, they would need to know more stipulations about how the program is going to function and how it's going to operate so that they can meet those deadlines um, that are fast approaching. So I just really just wanted to reiterate that um, as well and also to see um, how this program can coincide with the restaurants program um, so that these two things are in some ways at some points, not always, but if there can be intersections. I hear you uh, loud and clear. Um, one of the things I've been saying is that, uh, unfortunately this year, not only is about um, distributing the funds that my agency always distributes, but how can we help them, um, um, the organizations find ways in which they can spend those funds, right? You know, um, in the absence of having a, a venue. So um, open culture would be the, 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 the place. And I look forward to a, a city in the spring full of arts and culture. Um, and, and who knows, hopefully this can become a, a yearly um, tradition. Thank you. Chair Van Bramer, I don't see any other hands raised in Zoom. Okay. Um, this would conclude the administration testimony if we don't have any other questions from council members. Okay, um, that sounds good. First, thank you again to the majority leader for allowing her impossibly adorable son to be a part of the hearing today. Um, uh, very, very special moment. Uh, well, maybe more special for us, but uh, it was uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes a challenging moment for mom, but uh, a special for us. Uh, so uh, I know we want to really hear from uh, the community, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost on on what it's uh, it, what it, what the reality is right now to be an artist in the city of New York, uh, and and so I will thank Commissioner Casals uh, for being here for his testimony for his uh, care and and love of this community, but turn it over to the council so we can uh, hear from artists themselves about this moment and if they. Uh, wish the pieces of legislation also being considered. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. So now that we have now that we have concluded the administration's testimony, we will turn to the public testimony portion of this hearing. I'd like to remind everyone that individuals will be called up in panels. So for members of the public, please note I will call you up in panels um, of three or four. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on after everyone in the panel has completed their testimony. Um, if you have questions for a particular panelist, um, again, at the end of the panel and for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give the go ahead to begin after setting a timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes today. Um, apologies. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. So we will begin with the first panel. I will call the names of the members of that panel and then call you individually. The first panel, panel one, will be Cheryl Warfield from Moore Opera, Jared Packard from Safe Harbors Indigenous Collective, Don Christian Jones from Public Assistance Inc., and Chi Ase. Um, and again, please uh, excuse any pronunciation and errors um, with my apologies. So the first panelist and the first witness today from the public will be Cheryl Warfield. You may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Starting time. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, and members of City Council for hearing me today. 
I speak before you to provide insight from a mature performing artist's vantage on the impact of COVID-19 and my perspective as a working artist whose opportunities to work, interpret, and create have been decimated and whose economic value has depreciated since the pandemic. I am Cheryl Warfield, a professional opera singer and a long-standing member of three unions, including the American Guild of Musical Artists, AGMA, my parent union. I have performed at the Metropolitan Opera on Broadway and throughout Europe. I produce innovative arts programming for underserved communities as a teaching artist and as the director of Moore Opera, which I founded 20 years ago. I am here today to provide a name and a face to my story as an artist. I began producing opera a year after 9-11, including opera concerts with full orchestra employing more than 40 local 802 instrumentalists in addition to the singers. My desire to create meaningful work for myself and others is great, but my ability to do this on a regular basis has been, uh, uh, has had budgetary restrictions. Now COVID-19 has taken away most performing opportunities that opera singers have, especially paid gigs. Further, the ability to practice our art, even privately in coachings, can put artists at risk. There are no auditions, no rehearsals, no chances to sing with others, and most paid gigs fall under the less artistically satisfying construct of pre-recorded music. But what is most devastating and least quantifiable is the lost time and lost opportunities due to the cancellation of performances in 2020. For mature artists, this is devastating. While I have pivoted into online concertizing, it is not the same. Inspired. Once the pandemic is over, I will start to uh, start over to rebuild my career, but need help to do that for myself and for other artists uh, so that we can help um, to bring back our vibrant arts community while helping COVID impacted communities as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cheryl. We'll come back to how we can be helpful in that. Thank you. The next panelist will be Jared Packard. Done. Hao mi takiyapi Jared Packard e machiapi. Oglala, South Dakota, Hematahan, Ayash, Brooklyn, New York, Awati. Hello, my relatives. My name is Jared Packard. I come from Oglala, South Dakota, and I live here in Brooklyn, New York. I am on the Community Advisory Board of Safe Harbors of NYC. Safe Harbors NYC is a native theater company that creates, presents, and promotes native specific theater, performance work, training, education, and activism. I'm also the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Urban Indigenous Collective, a nonprofit focused on improving the health and wellness of the Indigenous community in New York City. Dear committee, we are testifying before you today to inform you that our community does not have a dedicated theater, performance, or communal gathering space in New York City to present native specific performance work, as well as to offer community inter interventions that are medical, social, and mental health related. We do not separate our performance theater or art practices from our medical, social, or mental health. We see them as interconnected interventions that support and inform each other in diverse ways. The connection between the two is paramount. They are interdependent. Our culture is our medicine. Dear community, the following is the solutions we ask for. A building space specifically in Lower Manhattan that will meet, function as a community hub that will meet the following needs. Be a space for Native American community theater and performance, which we can offer as an individual and collective container for Native artists, performers, and community members to gather and connect. A space where we can conduct Native specific feasts and ceremonies, a space where we can gather and express our cultural needs, which are essential to our existence and well being. Finally, a space where we can provide a culturally relevant health and mental health service for community members and community Native artists. We lost two community members within the same family within a week of each other, Kevin Tarrant, Ho-Chung Kompi, and his stepmother, Victoria Tarrant, Manan Hidatsa, both of whom were language and song keepers of our community. Once COVID-19 subsides and people can gather once more, we would like to have our own space where we can honor our relatives who were taken from us by this pandemic. In conclusion, we come to you and ask your support for a designated Indigenous theater and community space in Lower Manhattan where we can begin to resolve our historic and intergenerational trauma that has been exacerbated by COVID-19. Thank you for your time, Thank you. Thank you so much. Next panelist is Tony Jones. 
I'm an interdisciplinary multimedia, a multimedia creator and arts educator here in New York City. My creative activity for the past nine years, music, performance, um, and over 40 community-based murals has been informed uh, by my concurrent work as a teaching artist and muralist in schools, shelters, probation centers, and most extensively on Rikers Island with incarcerated youth. Um, in fact, the underpinnings of my work, its structure and content are derived from those experiences. These include intergenerational, intercultural discourse, the unmaking of white sensibility models, uh, supremacy models and systems of disenfranchisement and the implications of mass incarceration on black liberation. Um, I'm here representing public assistance, which is a mutual aid uh, network resist research design lab and resistance hub, which we founded here in Crown Heights on June 6th of last year. Um, as an organize, not organizing base in response to the confluence of COVID-19 um, and global socio-political uprising. Public assistance has both led and partnered a multitude of community initiatives since its inception, among them paid youth mural residency programs, um, public art making and open call radio program, a free bike repair and refurbish initiative, a community fridge and garden, toy and coat drives, hot meal care package distribution and wellness workshops for collective care and resilience. In addition to our community program, we may design, produce, and fabricate anything um, from our, by our eclectic team of artists, makers, organizers, builders. Um, our capabilities include banners, sets, uh, media for protests, murals, visual media, photography, video, garment design, sustainable green design. Um, and on, as of last week, we have been threatened with eviction. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the current, current property owners of public assistance, we operate out of a vacated laundromat, um, notified us that we, they are going to begin construction on a new development, probably a gourmet supermarket within the next 20 to 50 days, leaving us really devastated and shocked. And, and uh, you know, we're in like this crazy mode trying to sustain and figure out what to do next, but we are a beloved staple of this community already and we are going to fight to remain here and in solidarity with our neighbors. Um, I could go on, but thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Van Bremer, um, we do not have any council member hands raised. If you have any questions for this panel. Uh, well, I see uh, Majority Leader Combo's hand raised again, uh, but I will, uh, uh, ask a few questions and then pass it over to Majority Leader Cumbo. Uh, uh, and you'll let me know if there are any other members of the committee who, um, who wish to speak. Um, but I, I, I feel like uh, Cheryl, who's been before the committee a few times and uh, speaks so powerfully, and it's very painful uh, for me to hear, uh, you know, that, that you can't uh, that you can't sing uh, as much and certainly not in the way that, that we wish you could. Um, but uh, uh, you were just getting to the point of, of talking about uh, coming out of uh, COVID and, and sort of getting back um, uh, up to speed, if you will. And, and what does that look like to you and, and how could the, the city uh, be helpful uh, to you in particular and then maybe even others in your field? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say um, thank you to the people of uh, um, the people who I work with at Culture at Three. I wouldn't be here today if it were not for Culture at Three. Um, they have embraced me as an arts administrator, albeit that More Opera is a very small organization. Uh, it's a grassroots organization, um, and they have provided amazing information to me. I didn't know anything about how to testify for council prior to being a part of Culture at Three. Um, and what I would like to see would be some kind of forum for individual artists that uh, collectively that um, identifies those artists who perhaps are not a part of larger organizations. So for example, you know, I've done fundraising for my organization before. Um, I have received some money in the past from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, but I've never actually received any money directly from DCLA 
and, um, and really don't know exactly how to go about doing that. And considering that my organization has been in existence for 20 years, that's a little bit unfortunate. And so when I also hear you know, that there are artists who are being brought in by DCLA, how do artists like myself end up on that list without knowing, how do we find out about this? And so somewhere um, through social media and everything, we have to do uh, more outreach. Thank you, and I see a lot of uh, um, folks agreeing with you, um, uh, but that is, that is helpful and I know DCLA um, is still on the call in some capacity, but yes, we, we've got to uh, do more because there are um, behind you, Cheryl, probably hundreds if not thousands of artists uh, who have uh, uh, small organizations that have just never been um, interacted with, right? Have never gained access to the system, don't know how to gain access to the system, are just doing the work, right? Raising. Uh, some bucks here and there and, and doing it, but, uh, but have no idea um, how to access. Uh, and the city uh, and DCLA certainly needs to do a better job of bringing in uh, folks and expanding the, this particular franchise. And I just would like you to know that there is so much more that I can do in other organizations like mine. We want to do it. We want to make things better, not just for even artists, for communities. And I would love to, and I think that we can find innovative ways to create opportunities for artists to work again, to work and, but also help build the communities. And but there's just so much that can be done, not just in education. And then when I hear, when the governor you know, spoke about you know, uh, actually creating uh, new spaces in Midtown or Downtown to make sure that, that artists have venues within these spaces, and, but not just the larger organizations that there's equal access for everyone. And I truly believe that we are now at a point where we're willing to open things up to everyone. So I'm very hopeful. Yes, well, uh, we could have our own hearing on, on the governor's announcement um, to have really big concerts and really big venues with millionaire superstar uh, performers. Uh, and I love uh, Nisa Amy Schumer, but uh, I think, uh, at this moment, we need to be much more concerned about Cheryl, Warf Cheryl Warfield and not Amy Schumer. Um, so um, uh, I, I just want to say thank you, Cheryl. And, and when you're able to uh, belt out those tunes uh, uh, for the first time in a, in a crowd, I hope to be- that you will allow me and that you will record me singing happy birthday to your mother. <laughs> now you're just going to make me cry. Um, so. Yes, I would love that, but thank you. Uh, but I really want to hear you sing um, because you've testified now a couple of times before the committee and, uh, and I, I think it would be very good for, for the soul to just hear you sing. Um, I did want to, um, uh, to Mr. Jones, um, that testimony was very powerful and obviously the situation uh, you currently find yourself in uh, devastating to hear. Um, and uh, and look, I obviously am an elected official and I am in government and, and I understand that uh, the mutual aid uh, movement, which I obviously support, but it is uh, at least for some inherently a critique of, of government, right? And, and of the system and not seeking uh, in many cases uh, to work with or, or uh, interact with or receive support uh, from the very system that it's critiquing. So I just wanted to ask, um, uh, you know, how how are you um, fighting this, and and uh, uh, you know, to what extent, you know, could or should uh, uh, the government be helpful? Understanding that um, that uh, you know, mutual aid in and of itself is a critique of the system, right? And, and in some ways, does not want to, does not seek to work with it. Absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a really great question, and I 
value you asking it. Um, I think we've had in the past week or so, we've had to do a lot of reconciling for ourselves as to uh, the outlets or, 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 or means to, uh, to, to getting somewhere out, you know, out of this situation. Um, and we've just been referred extensively to the city and folks that, you know, members of our, of our community believe in, including um, uh, Ms. Combo. Um, so, you know, I'm just taking the suggestions of our, our hyperlocal community. And I believe that, you know, there's, there's ample room to still work together. Um, it's, it, this is this whole situation, it's been, it's alarming, but it's not unforeseen. Um, we had this lease, this very loose lease that we were kind of bullied into signing um, at the end of the summer. Um, and there was this risk of, of sudden termination, but we also are a safe haven for queer, black, brown youth um, as we see these spaces disappearing fast or just being rare in itself. So it's just a precarious situation. I'm trying to provide safe space and brave space for already marginalized um, folks. So to think that we're kind of in this trepidatious situation with uh, property managers who are kind of uh, exercising like muscle uh, tactics of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, intimidation. I, I'm just trying to ensure the safety of this space, our, our physical space, but our, our bodies, um, all, that we, all that we do here, all the programmatic efforts, um, all the tech and supplies and materials that exist here. Um, sorry, I, ho I hope that helps. But yeah, yeah the question uh, I'm left reconciling, but I, I obviously believe in, in, in the work of, of, of many city workers. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for uh, the, the, the safe uh, and brave space that you are building, uh, particularly for uh, queer youth of color, right? I mean, that is uh, incredibly uh, rare um, to have those spaces. And it just sounds like what you're doing there, both you and, and obviously the community uh, is amazing and should be uh, maintained and protected. Uh, you mentioned uh, Ms. Cumbo, so I feel like that is a, a perfect opportunity to uh, bring the majority leader into the discussion um, to ask any of the panelists, but, but maybe also yourself. Thank you. Just wanted to, I know you said, uh, Council Member Van Bramer, that uh, DCLA was still on the call um, on the Zoom. I don't know if because we're doing it in our offices and I know that things have transitioned. My question to DCLA and if we could, if they're still not on the call, if the council could follow up, is DCLA doing any kind of online, how to apply for the DCLA upcoming grants? How do you get your paperwork in? Uh, sort of a help desk. I think that that's one aspect that we could just start the process and have other opportunities where people could weigh in if they need additional help and support um, in order to strengthen their organization. Because um, an organization of the caliber that uh, Cheryl has outlined should certainly be with their years of service to the community um, for consideration. And I would also recommend Cheryl as well, looking at your local arts councils, as well as when I started my organization, Mokata, I was very much supported by the New York Foundation for the Arts as well. So that's also some place that I've gone to for um, initial help. But my question more specifically for Cheryl, um, and then I want to um, get to Don Christian in a, in a moment, is what are you doing on a monthly basis in order to make it? What does an artist who has been shut out of the entire process of performances, opportunities to present what does how are you piecing together living every month um thank you um majority leader and i don't mean to be so pers you know what i mean but i think it'd be helpful to know if it's a little too sketchy you don't have to get into it but <laughs> you don't have to tell us all the secrets but basically um actually um it's a, a, a part that i had to cut out of my two minutes uh, but um, I have um, I have actually the good fortune, although I put it in my past, a degree. Um, in I'm sorry, I'm gonna mute myself. 
I did not have the opportunity. Um, my father did not allow me to major in music in college. Um, what, interestingly enough, though, um, because of my um, accounting degree, that's actually how, when I still was in Ohio, was able to start my not-for-profit with the business acumen that I, uh, that I learned in school. Um, and, uh, and that is what has enabled me to, on a shoestring budget, to create some phenomenal art that, that, um, that looks like it may have cost a lot more than, than it did. Um, but in terms of trying to make things now, well, first and foremost, um, as the primary administrator for my organization, that is, a, I, I do that on a volunteer basis. Uh, but I am fortunate enough that as a teaching artist, I actually work with senior citizens and I also work with um, elementary school kids. And um, I have been able to keep going doing that and a couple of, of small side gigs um, that, I, that I've been able to do to make ends meet right now. Uh, During this time, you've been able to do those? Uh, I actually have. Um, That's wonderful. Um, senior Center in the Bronx that I work with, the Jazza Van Cortland Senior Center. And it's not a lot of money. It, it right. only pays probably uh, a, less than a fourth of my rent each month. Mm -hmm. but, but between that and, um, and a couple of other side gigs, I actually work for the U.S. Census Bureau 10 days a month. You go ahead, Cheryl. You're going to make it work. <laughs> what about... Um... I mean, it's not easy, but um, in, in fact, that's another thing that I would love to do is to even work with artists talking about budgeting and how to keep going and how to stay afloat in times like this. Have you been able to qualify for, um, for unemployment or any of the types of programs that are out there? So... Um, two things. First of all, um, when I'm not working for the Census Bureau those 10 days a week, I do qualify for unemployment, but because um, it's freelance, it's, it's not, it's one fourth of the amount that, of the, uh, that most people get for unemployment. But mm. again, every little bit helps. That's and right. I also was able to get um, a very small PPP loan. Oh, that's fantastic. And again, I credit um, culture at three, at three. because um, I, my bank was not doing anything to help with securing that loan. And I got some valuable information during one of the meetings that helped me to be able to contact my bank and say the right things. You go ahead, Cheryl. You need a, a podcast of some sort. Thank you so much for, for sharing that and, and getting us that information. I really applaud your efforts. I know it's a really tough time, but you know, the culture at three really shows the power of community and what can come together when we share information uh, amongst everyone. It helps the entire community. Um, I wanted to uh, ask Gerard, did I pronounce it correctly? Uh, he's got to be unmuted. Mr. Packard has to be unmuted. There's a slight delay, but we're unmuting. Thank you. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yes, Jer uh, Jared is how you pronounce my name. Jared. Um, are you familiar with the organization Amarinda? Um, yes, I've heard of Amarinda. I think it would be so powerful when I'm hearing of your mission um, and mm -hmm. hearing of their mission. Uh, not to hear, not not to, you know, there's also, as we, I was just saying, power in community. And I think it would be really powerful to partner with them to kind of see what are they doing and what has been their experience in terms of advancing the work of the Native American community in New York City from a local not-for-profit um, indigenous space and voice. So I, I just wanted to make that suggestion um, as one. Thank you. And, and I'll share my information in the chat to so that you can follow yeah. up so I can make a direct connection as well. Okay, thank you so much for that. 
Definitely. And Don um, wanted to ask, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. It's so great to put names and faces and, and places and work together. A few quick questions and I'll also share my um, information as well. Um, what is the square footage of space that the organization is looking for about? Um, so, you know, it's been like a whirlwind, but we even started looking at new spaces uh, yesterday and uh, the past two days. We're really hoping for like something street facing, community facing for which people feel like invited and welcome to come consult with us. Um, but ideally something from three to three to 4,500 square feet. Um, and we're really also interested in like more raw industrial or alternative space. We, we, we don't want something that feels clinical or feels like a community org or like a school. You know, uh, we're really trying to embody a new vision or a new imagined uh, space for what community movement, educational work can look and feel like. Um, makes sense. Now, are you all in a position at this point to start to receiving governmental funding, foundation, et cetera? I think, we, I think if we want to stay alive, we have to, yes. Yes, and then thus far we've gotten we've gotten thus far solely off of private donations, you know, uh, and micro grants. Um, in the beginning of COVID, I've just, I was just like full force applying for everything, and you know, I I'm apt and have the agency to do so, but I realize that so many of my peers don't, or or even have the access or language to 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 get so much of the funding that we got just to get off the ground. Um, but I think going forward, we're really going to have to. Uh, expand our, our model as to where the sources of funding come from or even space. But that is really what it is. We want to stay in solidarity with our neighbors because they've been here longer than us, 10 years. Um, but we also don't want to ex exacerbate or extend this really contentious, negative, energetically like relationship with these property owners that don't want us here, but they want proximity to the movement and they want the tax write off. Um, it just doesn't feel healthy. Okay, so let's, it, it sounds like it's a, a fancy way of saying you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul right now to get through the pandemic. Um, and I appreciate that. But I, I do want to help. I don't have like an idea, you know, there's not, there's not an idea and like, oh, I've got the perfect place. I do have some ideas, but I would like to talk with you offline to further explore. I think if we put our minds together, um, we can find something together. And I think with all three of these conversations, it's like, it's the power of community and togetherness is definitely gonna get us through. So I'm gonna figure out how to share my information with you on the chat <laughs> while I get this apple juice together for my son and we're gonna make it happen. Thank you so much, Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you, Majority Combo. Uh, thank you, uh, Cheryl. And, and, and I'll get your uh, contact information through the, the council and, and we'll figure out some way to uh, uh, have you record happy birthday to my mother because uh, uh, I will see her later today and, and we'll happily show her uh, that uh, video uh, uh, as we Zoom with my siblings uh, later tonight with a cake for my mom, but thank you. Um, and to the rest of the panelists, uh, uh, Gerard and uh, Don Christian, thank you very much. Um, uh, much respect uh, to both of you uh, for all of the work that you do um, and being a part of this hearing. And, uh, and certainly, certainly hope, Don Christian, that uh, uh, the community is able to uh, secure uh, either the home you currently have or a new home. Um, uh, and uh, with the assistance of, of whoever you uh, uh, choose to engage in that process. Thank you so much. If I might add, we are a nonprofit, just if that adds context. We are a formal 5013C. Yes, uh, which means you're eligible for funding uh, if you uh, choose to apply for it. Uh, so uh, I know that's, that's, that's a choice, right? That's actually um, a discussion. Uh, in 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 the mutual aid movement, but uh, but uh, whatever you choose to do, I, I support. And and if you uh, uh, do seek uh, funding, uh, you know you should get it. Uh, uh, that uh, is my opinion. But um, but thank you. So with that, I will excuse uh, uh, this panel and ask the council to introduce the next panel.
Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, just to preface the next panel, apologies again for any pronunciation errors. And just a reminder that at the end of all panels today, we will be calling for any witnesses that we have um, in unintentionally missed. So the next panel will be three members. This is panel two. I'll call your names as a panel and then individually to testify. The members will be Jerome Harris, from the Music Workers Alliance, Alejandra Duque Chifuentes from Dance NYC, and Orietta Crispino from Theater Lab Inc. So the first panelist is Jerome Harris. You may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you so much. Out in time. Thank you, all present. I'm Jerome Harris. Um, I'm testifying on behalf of Music Workers Alliance, which is a volunteer organization of folks who work in the crafting and presenting of expressive sound. Um, uh, in December, we conducted a survey of music workers that we are in touch with about how the pandemic has been affecting them. I've posted uh, that uh, survey results, the results on that survey to, um, as written testimony to this hearing. Um, so you should be able to access that there. Uh, I will use this time to speak to uh, our thoughts on these bills, these two bills that are um, on this hearing's agenda on intro uh, 2194. Um, we very much favor uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs conducting a study of the real estate issues that have led to the city losing cultural spaces and coming up with recommendations that would counter that loss. Um, this has been, you know, the, the loss of cultural spaces in the city, as you, I'm sure you all know, has been, you know, in a, a problem for decades. And, um, you know, and it's been in this period, it's certainly been leading to artists leaving the city or deciding to not come to New York City. You know, there's, you know, people are in Philadelphia and upstate towns in, you know, in the Hudson Valley and going to Buffalo and going to Detroit. Uh, so anything that, you know, the city can do to, you know, to stanch that loss um, particularly since that loss has probably um, been accelerated by the current pandemic. You know, we Inspired. see. Oh, thank you. Did you want to finish up uh, what you were saying, Mr. Harris? Um, well, I did want to just mention our thoughts about uh, intro 2195, about the certification, you know, of artists. Um, it's not been publicized what that certification is designed to enable in terms of city programs. We are very interested in finding out. Um, we have some ideas along that line. Um, we also are a bit concerned that DCLA's advisory commission, um, you know, in terms of its working on the, the certification criteria, that it may not adequately represent the views of performing arts professionals, um, you know, just looking at, you know, who's on, who's currently on that commission. Um, so this is something that we, we wonder about. And we also um, want to make sure that the certification and the implementation um, is made available to those who face you know, barriers, uh, you know, of this because of disability or a lack of computer skills or a lack of savvy and navigating bureaucracies, you know, any of these, these impediments. And also um, the certificate, certified artist status must not be used as a cudgel um, for enforcing unjust social biases or personal vendettas as the, the city's old cabaret card regime, you know, decades ago, um, you know, did it so you know was used in that way. So we just want to you know log log those those thoughts. Absolutely, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Harris. Um, and I see Olympia uh, on my screen. I don't know if uh, you're speaking, 
uh, Olympia, but uh, okay. Um, we want that energy uh, that you bring to everything uh, as well. But uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. All those points are incredibly important and well taken. And I think we're gonna hear from uh, some of the folks who, who really uh, uh, have been thinking a lot about this particular piece of legislation and, uh, and what is hoped to be accomplished with it but all of those uh, warning signs are well taken and, uh, uh, and obviously have to be um, addressed before uh, we would move forward with anything like this, right? It, it, it cannot in any way isolate or harm uh, uh, artists um, uh, who may not have access. And of course, how one defines an artist is, uh, in some ways, very, very personal, very subjective, and uh, and uh, there has to be a clear way of doing this um, that does no harm and only does good. Um, so, uh, thank you. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Alejandra is next, but um, I think, uh, Brenda, do you need to call on her or how do we do that? No, you can call on Ms. C. Fuentes. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, thank you, Chair. Alejandra Duque C. Fuentes. Yes, well said. Um, I'm actually going to uh, follow a very similar structure to my colleague here. We've submitted, we'll submit our testimony and provide a lot of detail and data, but I wanna provide some immediate reflections on the two pieces of le legislation. First and foremost, the issue around rent is the one issue that we have identified is equally impacting independent artists and organizations at the same time. And so addressing comprehensive rent relief, all kinds of ways in which legislation, tax breaks, there's a variety of suggestions that we provide in our testimony, but putting our efforts in addressing rent issues will influence and, and change the landscape for independent artists and for artistic communities across the board. If we're trying to really break our heads on like, what is the one thing we can do? This is it, right? And so one of the things in talking about rent is we know, and we've seen, for example, with the CIG program, that when organizations get their space covered, right? When they don't have to be worried about where they're going to live and how they're going to move and can they pay their electricity, et cetera, it creates the opportunity for them to thrive. We also know that historically, the inaccessibility of land or property is the number one marker of injustice in terms of the relationship to the slave trade and to the stolen lands of indigenous peoples. And so if we really want to address justice and we want to care for our cultural institutions and our artists, we have to address rent and we have to address land ownership and land care more than ever. In terms of the legislation to support independent individual artists and the artist certification, I think it's uh, actually before I get to that, I think it's great that we're trying to get data to understand how to support organizations and the issue of uh, in the question of land and, and their spaces. But we've known this information for years. Uh, we know what people need. We can't keep saying we're going to gather data as a way to circumvent and like slowly build up to change. We're in a place, you know, it was Martin Luther King Day yesterday. We're about to have a new administration. We can't be leaning on these incremental changes thing and hope for the better at the cost of the very people that we intend to serve. As we look at legislation 2195, I echo what my colleagues are saying around ensuring that whatever is created doesn't um, reinforce systems of oppression and biases. Um, but there is precedence historically across the world where governments have formal infrastructures that support artists. If we look at France, they have a program called Intermittents, and that program creates the opportunity to provide access to unemployment benefits, all kinds of state and intentional support that allows those communities to thrive there. And so there is precedent, historical precedent, a lot of countries do it, where we can support artists. One of the things that I'll say that is important about this and thinking about reducing the labor that artists have to endure when requesting financial support is how a system like this can move us in the direction of common applications and grant app in, in, in accessing grants, how we can streamline and, and create an opportunity for more communication across agencies and across uh, where artists can act as both vendors 
or where also artists can receive financial support. And so I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity for a program like this. And while the government should not legislate who is and is not an artist, the uh, government has a mandate to support these cultural um, workers. And in creating a system like this, I think it's an opportunity if we do it with a, a lens on justice connected to the very artists informing how that is developed and ensuring that we're not replicating Eurocentric leanings um, in how we do it, that, that it's an opportunity for us to move in the direction of a formal structure of support for artists from the government. So those are my two kind of main reflections to the committee as we think about both of these pieces of legislation. And in, and in our testimony, we've of course provided a lot of data and specific recommendations. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, the final panelist uh, for this panel will be Orietta Crispino from Theater Lab, Inc. Hi, thank you, Chairman um, and everybody. Um, I totally second what Alejandra said. So I'm gonna, you know, compact my testimony and um, and um, and say that for 15 years, Theater Lab has served the community of performing artists with resources such as affordable space to create and present live works. Our signature white box space is flexible in nature and intimate in size, have been inspiring to create contemporary forms of presentations, welcoming new audiences to a very unique experience of art and gathering. In 15 years, I built two different venues. For seven years, I was downtown on 14th Street and uh, from 2005 to 2012. And now since 2013, we moved to um, the Garment District, West 36th Street. Uh, we're led by a group of women artists, creative, resilient, resourceful, and we'd like to be a small nonprofit organization. Rent, property tax, and renegotiation with our lease, um, with our landlord, have been our main issues pre and post COVID. We need help to craft new partnerships with landlords. We cannot keep creating if we constantly fight. We need incentives to property owners leasing to artists, and in so doing, sharing the burden of the pandemic. Some points. One, property tax break, possibly calculated proportionally to the duration of a lease, encouraging lengthier tenancies. Two-year leases are not of great help. Only through time can we really weave ourselves in the city fabric, creating community and impacting the lives of the citizens. Accessing operating Please grants money is often predicated on the length of a lease. Two, eliminate the portion of property tax that is passed on to commercial tenants in Manhattan between 96th Street and Chamber Street, Street that effectively raised our monthly rent last year by $1,000 and that the landlord is not willing to reduce, putting us at risk of closing. Three, assist with legal help in lease negotiation and technical needs for a safe, hopefully, reopening. How do we assess ventilation systems? Is there any way to share the cost of upgrading with property owners? Four, assisting in developing better maintenance practice by building private, by including private landlords in sharing benefits from mixed city programs. Example from my previous venue, I was able to access as nonprofit the cool roof program for the building we were leasing and had the roof coated for experimental green purposes for free. My old landlord is probably still benefiting from it after I was gone. Five, access to capital for artists to help with purchasing real estate. We think that artist certification could be a, um, a help in starting that conversation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. 
Are there any other panelists on this ICU uh, uh, <laughs> majority that are going to vote? Uh, any other uh, panelists on this panel? No, Chair Van Bramer, this is the final witness for this panel. And Majority Great. Leader Gumbo has her hand raised. Yes, I, I, uh, I do see that. Um, uh, do you want to uh, go first in this round, Majority Leader? I just... <clears throat> I just want to say, I just wanted to say, I mean, I don't know how appropriate it is, but um, I'm, I'm always so inspired and excited by the DCLA hearings. It's kind of my way to reconnect. And this is a bit out of order, but it's like a lot of this passion and energy that I'm hearing right now, you know, Councilmember Van Bramer and I are both term limited. So this is our last year. But this type of fire and energy and passion has to go on in the next council. I don't really know if there are art professionals that have um, decided to run, have entered into that realm, but the only way to really ensure the type of change that you want to see is to have people directly from the field into this because it's a different way of thinking. It's a different language. It's a different sensibility. You know, it's it's late, but I'm still seeing people jump into the race from citywide office all the way down every single day. So, you know, this type of advocacy and passion has to continue and it has to continue with the types of passion and energy that I'm hearing on this call right now. So if you haven't thought about it, think about it. Um, I am very concerned about what will happen with a lot of the gains that Chair Van Bramer and myself have made um, in this council. It's, it's funny, but it's not funny. Anytime we step into a room and people have kind of already decided what's going to be, they'll say, oh God, here comes Jimmy and Lori. Okay, we got to put the arts in. Where do you all see the arts? How do you want it to be? Um, and in my capacity as the majority leader, um, it's, it's different because now Jimmy is fighting for the arts and I have to reel him back in a little bit. So it's like this weird kind of, you know, it's this weird kind of energy and space. But I also wanted to add um, to Alejandra, I, I'm really feeling a lot of what you said and you're probably gonna be like, oh my goodness, you don't know this already. But I think as this is our last year, um, and what you all were testifying, it would be wonderful to have a document that puts together the best practices throughout the world and maybe throughout the nation where you have seen these types of examples and how they have actually and specifically worked. Because we may have a lot of good ideas, but the beauty of seeing practices that have worked in other countries or other nations is that they've worked it out. So like, for example, maybe some of the things are based off of a hotel tax. Maybe some of the things are based off of a referendum that they put on the voting ballot that says X, Y, and Z. Like, if we can have that type of documentation of best practices and how those best practices are functioning um, throughout the world or throughout the nation, it gives Chair Van Bramer and myself a real opportunity to create legislation or maybe even budget priorities for how we implement some of these things in our last year. But even if we don't bring these things over the finish line, it's so important to begin to put these ideas out because most importantly, we wanna see that the arts are, are no longer considered a fringe benefit of New York City and I don't know how to state it any more clearly for the people throughout the city, but it is the backbone of our financial economy. If you can't understand anything else, understand the economics of it, which seems to be something that people understand. So, you know, if, if a document or discussion through Culture at Three could begin to say, we want to put together this best practice document, that would be so powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Majority Leader. And, and we, we've talked about this a few times. Um, and, you know, when I uh, listen to uh, Alejandra and some others, I, I get fired up too and, and automatically start thinking, boy, uh, I hope Alejandra runs for office one day. 
Um, <laughs> and and uh, because it's so true that we need people, uh, and I realized that, you know, the government is not for everyone. Uh, people are right to be incredibly frustrated uh, by the, the structural inequities uh, that exist, um, but, uh, but we, we, we make it better, however painfully incrementally, when, when artists and, and people who care about the arts are in government. Uh, when, when we're not, um, there are very, very few people willing to fight uh, for the arts and artists. And I have been in the council uh, for 11 years. I am the chair of this committee for all 11 years. And I can tell you that, that, that when the doors are closed and the press aren't watching and people are fighting, um, there aren't that many people who fight for the arts. Um, and that's why you need um, uh, people uh, like Gloria and myself who, who have um, uh, a history with the arts before we got elected um, who then are more willing um, uh, to fight, right? And, and who will go um, to great lengths to fight. So um, this run, is- Run, Alejandra, run! <laughs> I didn't uh, want to say it, but girl, run! <laughs> and, and there are so many others- You can others. still dance, you can still dance! <laughs> <laughs> there are so many others, um, uh, you know, uh, Sheila Lewandowski is uh, very, very active in uh, uh, in uh, Western Queens and uh, and so many others. But uh, but I, I mean it. Uh, we we need folks, and even if folks aren't going to run in this cycle, um, but to be engaged, right? Um, uh, to be engaged in 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 your community, uh, civically, politically. Um, and, uh, and again, people have talked about uh, having a, a, an umbrella organization for artists and, and arts groups, kind of like New, York, New Yorkers for Parks or other things like that, that can actually, um, and I know that there are individual organizations that do this, but uh, uh, have forums, have questionnaires, ask, uh, candidates where they stand on issues affecting artists uh, uh, before they get elected. So they're at least thinking about these issues because so many don't even think about them. I will just say, uh, lastly, um, Mr. Harris, uh, um, uh, Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, uh, and yes, I say that name correctly. Um, uh, very uh, proud. I live in Queens and uh, have a challenging last name myself, so I feel like it's important to uh, 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 get people's names right. Um, uh, and uh, Orieta, thank you. All of you, I just want to say, yes, to Alejandra's point, um, it is not new to us that the uh, inequities and the uh, power structures uh, favor uh, landowners, um, uh, landlords, uh, big real estate, and, and the horrific effects that has on communities, including uh, cultural communities. Um, and, and a study can seem uh, like a very small and incremental step when faced with the crisis that we're faced with. I agree with that. Um, we can push for that bigger structural uh, change and, and we are, and, and I certainly am in many ways on the political side, but, but uh, you know, this is uh, something that's important for us to at least get people to focus on, talk about, acknowledge is the root of so many of the problems, right? Um, uh, rent and, and the inability, uh, again, for people to, to produce um, and uh, plan and exist, to simply exist, right? Um, is, is threatened because of the, uh, land ownership and structural inequities that exist. So I just want to acknowledge uh, all of that. And I definitely feel that and support it. And uh, just like uh, Laurie said, I, I, I too get a lot of energy from these calls uh, and, um, and feel uh, fortified again, because all of you uh, uh, are so right and so good and so strong. So, so thank you. Uh, does the majority leader wish to speak again? Yes. Yes, and I, and I just wanna say I apologize. 
I can't figure out how to start a chat. So my email address is just my name at Gmail so that I can just get it right to my uh, personal. So if, if there was further communication and you didn't see it come up in the chat, it's because I, I don't judge. I don't have any capacity to figure out how to do that right now, but it's just lauricumbo at gmail.com um, or lcumbo at council.nyc.gov but it, it'll be better if you just send it to my personal email address. I've got to go do online circle time with my son. It's only a half hour. I hope to come right back, but I would really enjoy to hear from each of you. And if the hearing is still going on, I will be back. So thank you so much, uh, Council Member Van Bramer. This is really great. Again, definitely consider running for office. If there are individuals out there who want to do it, we need that fire. We need that energy. Um, run Alejandro to run. Okay, I'll see you all later. Thank you. And uh, committee council, do you wanna go to the third panel? Yes, thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. So this concludes panel two. We will now move to panel three. Uh, the, the panelists, there will be three witnesses on this panel. First is Lucy Sexton from New Yorkers for Culture and the Arts, followed by Christina Perry from Chain Theater, and third, Sheila Lewandowski from the Chocolate Factory in Queens. So um, again, we will hold questions to the end of the panel. The first panelist is Lucy Sexton, and you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, and members of City Council for hearing my and so many others' testimony. My name is Lucy Sexton. I'm proud to head New Yorkers for Culture and Arts, a citywide coalition of cultural groups and artists and culture workers from across the city. The damage of COVID to every artist, cultural worker, and organization has been immense. It's equally important to remember that the ability of artists, culture workers, and cultural organizations to survive in the city prior to COVID was already fragile. Last year at this time, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts did a series of cultural convenings in each borough. Affordable living and workspace were consistently a top priority. As we consider these two intros, it's important to focus on the goals. Intro 295, the process for certifying, or I would suggest registering artists and culture workers should aim to do three things. One, make it more possible for artists to live and remain in New York City. Two, create a pathway for artists to rise up in every community in the city. Three, state clearly that New York City values its artists and culture workers. While the creative economy is a huge driver for New York City, it employs an overly white workforce. We need to create pathways for lower income kids in every neighborhood to consider entering the field so they have access to the jobs in the nonprofit and for-profit culture sector later on. Can a registry do that? It might help. It would allow the city to offer perks and services. Some of those might include free or reduced admission to cultural events and institutions, creation of a, an email list for the city council's committee on cultural affairs to announce hearings, budgets, discretionary funding, and legislation to its core constituency, engaging them in the creation of future policy and funding. Private companies could offer perks to those on the registry as well, say when theaters need to pay for houses or a free opening day at museum exhibitions or reduce price Broadway tickets. Also, more, more ambitiously, it could provide access to affordable housing and workspace, access to subsidized health care, tax relief. Imagine an accomplished salsa musician in Queens who makes their living working in restaurants is able to register and receive some of these perks. It not only helps that person, but lets their kids, their community know that, that, that artistic practice is valued and rewarded. Imagine a young person with a degree in dance trying to carve out a living in the city who's welcomed into the workforce with this registry and is able to engage in more of the city's cultural activities because of it. Imagine an artist being able to use the registry to access health care and therefore to consider raising their family here or be able to raise a family here. I realize I am dreaming, dreaming, but mindfully creating this mechanism now could lay the groundwork for these dreams going forward. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist will be Christina Perry. Thank you. Time starts now. 
Good morning. My name is Christina Perry, and um, I'm the Director of Development of the Chain Theater located in Speaker Johnson's district. We were uh, formerly in Van Bram uh, Council Member Van Bremer's district. We operate two theatrical venues on 36th Street. Um, and I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak regarding Bill 2194. Also, as a member of the League of Independent Theater, I want to go on record and support the statements that will be made by uh, Lit members Guy Yedwab, excuse me, and Amy Todorov. We strongly urge the council to explore offering tax incentives to landlords who offer a minimum 10 year lease to nonprofit theatrical spaces and require that these savings be passed on to the tenants. Now I understand that reclassification is a really challenging process, yet we believe this will ensure sustainability and longevity of art spaces throughout the five boroughs while incentivizing landlords to maintain and create theatrical space in their buildings. We obviously support this offer for other art sectors. Theater is simply the industry I can best address. So in a post COVID world, it's very likely that performance venues will face numerous requirements from unions with respect to ventilation. And these necessary capital improvements will be burdensome for both nonprofit theaters and the landlords. NYC small theaters are places where the most difficult stories are told. And if there was ever a need to address difficult stories, now is the time. New York City sm small not-for-profit theaters provide numerous training opportunities for youth, seniors, and residents of all five boroughs while driving positive foot traffic and businesses to stores, restaurants, taxis, the subway. Our international film festival alone brings in hundreds of artists who don't live in New York City, who then frequent um, and, and support our local economy by staying in hotels who we create partnerships with and the countless of bars and restaurants they frequent during their visit. In addition, many theaters like ourselves have invested in significant improvements and renovation to the spaces we occupy. We improve the spaces and neighborhoods we reside. And so we're only improving it. I will close with this. Um, a Margaret Mead quote I recently came upon, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, concerned citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So thank you, Councilman, for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, our next and final panelist for this panel will be Sheila Lewandowski. You may begin when the Sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Sheila Lewandowski, co-founder and executive director of the Chocolate Factory Theater in Long Island City, Queens, and council member, Chairman Van Bramer's district. Um, so thank you, Chairman Van Bramer, Majority Leader Combo, and the committee for the opportunity to testify. I've submitted testimony. I'm gonna jump ahead to my suggestions. Um, they have mostly deal with land use because this is because of the time. Um, but just to frame some stuff, Chocolate Factory has existed in different forms in four different spaces. And we are not unusual in that we are artist led, artist founded, but we are unusual in that we've somehow managed through, hard, through a lot to, with the city of New York council members help to get a building which will be our permanent home. I'm also first vice chair of my community board and have learned a lot about land use stuff through and, and over development um, than doing that. So I'm gonna jump right in. I believe that city planning should be revamped and restructured. City planning should have a vision for sustainable livable communities that includes cultural spaces, that includes community centers, school seats, parks, gardens, medical facilities, supportive housing for people and families in need, public and alternative transportation accessible for all. I believe that HPD should redefine what housing is and what affordability is from the perspective of those needing affordability and not from a definition of what is market. That term has only come to mean we can't afford the asking price. And it is driven by the sellers, not the buyers and renters. This would help artists, many of whom remain low income, to remain in their communities and remain part of the city. I believe that the term community give back used in real estate with developers in negotiating with what they should provide for the community when they're asking for variances that make their projects more profitable should be eliminated and replaced with the city providing the developer with options to include as permanent venues um, for the community from a checklist of needs that city planning has as necessary for every community as I stated earlier. And this, commu and this includes community facilities that should be part of the development permanently. Fire. Keep going, Sheila. Just like the variances are, they get a permanent profit, we should get a permanent community facility. They should not make profit on the community facility, those rents should be at cost because it is for their tenant, it's for the entire community. I'm gonna go real fast in these last ones. The city should have an agency to, to insist nonprofits like community centers and cultural centers navigate real estate. There should be a pipeline for permanence that will be not, that, that um, will be for all. 
but if the city knows that culture and the arts are essential for humane, equitable, innovative, diverse, sustainable, and vibrant communities, then the city must be more proactive in the planning and development of these permanent facilities. Property tax structure should allow for tax exempt, exemption for spaces dedicated to nonprofits and art venues as part of a long lease, what other people said. And commercial rent regulation should be brought back to New York City for nonprofits and small businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I am uh, proud to represent you in the New York City Council and uh, 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 proud of our work uh, together over the last 11 years. Um, and uh, if you haven't already emailed me that personally, uh, will you? Um, uh, uh, because I, I strongly uh, agree with uh, all that you just said, and uh, uh, we have to have to fundamentally uh, re <laughs> reorient uh, uh, how we plan and and how we build. Uh, and that means uh, abolishing the current system and, and, and reimagining a new way that centers uh, community and people. Um, so uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely agree uh, with that. Um, and uh, Lucy, I just wanna say thank you. Um, I know uh, there, there are a number of uh, fierce women um, behind Culture at Three, but um, you, know, you heard Cheryl uh, speak about what it's meant for her. And I know it's meant for so many uh, uh, other uh, people. Um, and uh, Christina, I'm glad you're thriving, uh, um, but uh, uh, we, we certainly miss you in Queens, but appreciate the struggles that you have had, um, but, uh, but uh, like so many other people on this call, simply make it work, make it happen, but we need to do more. Uh, to make sure that everyone can be successful. Uh, I also just wanna recognize um, uh, that council member Dharma Diaz, uh, you know, remains on in the hearing and uh, from Brooklyn and wanna thank uh, her for listening to all of you as well. So I wanna um, give the council member a shout out because um, everyone uh, is making reference to, to me and the majority leader, but uh, council member Diaz, thank you for um, uh, uh, listening to all the artists. Um, so with that, uh, um, that ends this panel uh, and we'll go on to the fourth panel. And I think there are, there are only five. So we have a fourth panel and a fifth panel. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And that's correct, we have two panels left. So we'll call the panelists. If we inadvertently missed anybody during this hearing, uh, we will check at the end of the hearing. Uh, the next panel has three members. I'll call the name um, the names of each panelist and then call each individual witness. Uh, the next panel, panel four, will be Guy Yedwab. Apologies again for any mispronunciations. Amy Todorov and Randy Berry. So Guy uh, Yedwab from the League of Independent Theater, uh, you may begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Uh, thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, I'm president of the board of directors of the League of Pendant Theater. Uh, we're an advocacy organization representing those who work in or run small grassroots theaters across all five boroughs of the city. Uh, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to discuss how small arts, culture, and community venues are being displaced across New York City, especially during this current pandemic with nearly a full year of back rent owed and a lack of rent relief that's only going to accelerate this process. Uh, while studies can generate new information on this topic, we agree with Dance NYC that we already know so much about this problem. In the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, the League of Independent Theater proposed a property tax abatement to incentivize landlords who rent to nonprofits and keep their rents affordable. We secured letters of support from all 12 Manhattan community boards. They knew what we already know, that given the choice, landlords will pursue the most profitable use per square foot available to them. We need an incentive to get more landlords to choose culture over banks and luxury coffee shops. We already know that in the last decade since that campaign, over 70 theater venues have permanently closed. In 2017, following your legislation, the Department of Cultural Affairs created the Cultural Plan. As the commissioner noted, hundreds of artists across the city spoke about what we already know, that we need long-term affordable workspace and housing. And the People's Cultural Plan that was released in response spoke even more specifically to those needs and solutions. 
In 2019, the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment released a study on small theater. The study found what we already know, that the largest challenges facing the community were all related to physical space, access to theaters, operational spaces, and theater closures. I believe that based on what we already know, we can take action. Pass protections like commercial rent stabilization, create incentives like a property tax for landlords to get them to bring those spaces in uh, and keep them affordable. Uh, and I know that the council member uh, Kumbo has had to step away, but we also want to assure that uh, uh, the league is going to be hosting its endorsement pro uh, process for city council offices this year. So we're going to do what we can to make sure that this enthusiasm continues into the next term. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next panelist will be Amy Todorov. Thank you. Time starts now. There we go. Hi, uh, the League of Independent Theater is an all volunteer coalition formed in 2008 in response to this space loss emergency. And in those 13 years since the situation has deteriorated as we've just heard from Guy. COVID has only highlighted what we already know. Artists are forced to scramble for an ever dwindling supply of rehearsal work or performance space. And when they can find it, they can't afford it despite these powerful advocates like Orietta, who's doing what she can to support us. Uh, they also can't just afford to live their lives in New York. The inevitable result is that artists are fleeing New York City and creating art centers in Tempe, Arizona, Houston, Texas, and Mount Carmel, Illinois. In order to confront the systems that led us here, we need to do an accounting of lost space that starts with the independent theater artist in New York City, built upon the great work already being done by the Indie Theater Fund, the Music Workers Alliance, Dance New York City, and others. So Manhattan Theater Source in Greenwich Village has sat empty for the last decade. It's a zombie building and Safe Harbors has no space. How does that happen in New York City? We need commercial rent stabilization. We need to track developers that get a tax break for promising community art space, but never deliver. And we need tax incentives and other creative ideas like we heard from Sheila for those who rent to nonprofits, particularly those led by the global majority populations. We need to keep artists in New York City with real action. We have a lot of questions about an artist certification process. Can artist certification provide access to free or low cost healthcare? That would radically change the way artists get to live in New York. Can we get preferential con ed rates for artist run venues? Can you build a new WPA from this artist workforce? Can you expand the already existing city space program to give certified artists free access to the dormant city space or after hours when these city spaces aren't in use? So one last point. New York City likes to think of itself as a theater city. It's part of our identity. Uh, but if we're honest, this city has always been hard on artists. We look at these legends like Joe Papp and Ellen Stewart, but even Joe Papp got arrested and Ellen Stewart was shut down. They survived here. But the reality on the ground for artists is more dire today than it's ever been. And indie artists just aren't surviving. The make it work, make it happen hustle just isn't good enough anymore. So without serious intervention, this generation is already taking their talents out of New York City and building art in Mount Carmel, Illinois. Thank you. Thank you so much. The final member of this panel is Randy Berry. You may begin when the Sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Thank you for allowing me to speak today, everyone. My name is Randy Berry, I'm the Executive Director of the Indie Theater Fund and Indie Space. We serve the Indie community in the five boroughs with grants, free real estate, advisory and consulting services, and we offer an emergency fund that provided 600 grants to artists during COVID. We also con uh, consulted with over 60 venues during COVID on how to stay in their spaces during this very difficult time. Indie Space utilizes our large network of real estate professionals to offer free advisory and consulting services to our community. We give artists the tools they need to craft favorable leasing arrangements for themselves with their landlords and to move them into more sustainable relationship with their real estate. 
We're thrilled the council is considering new ways to address the real estate challenges that the most under-resourced and historically excluded artists and venues face in New York City. However, we know, as everybody else has mentioned, a number of studies have already been conducted on the subject, and we hope you'll refer to those completed studies and experts rather than spending another year before moving to radical action for change. How many more spaces will we have lost while we're conducting a new study? What we already know, commercial rent stabilization is key to not-for-profits being able to operate in New York City. Rent support and cancellation for those impacted by COVID with mortgage support for, um, as well is the only way that we will avoid more permanent closures. Consistent financial support on a city and state level and creative ownership and partnership structures lead to sustainability. We can use more city owned properties that are not being fully utilized. We can track community facility space usage and hold landlords accountable who are not making legal use of the space for their community. We offer tax incentives that are assigned to the not-for-profits. I think this is a key important difference. The tax incentive goes with the not-for-profit. So it benefits the landlord with reduced property taxes, but it follows the not-for-profit wherever they rent, giving the power to the not-for-profit rather than the building owners. We activate spaces with art, making it more financially beneficial to owners to actually use their space than to keep it empty. Invest in community land trusts, allowing artists to begin to own a stake in the properties that they dedicate their lives to building. Thank you so much for this opportunity to submit this testimony. Indie Space would love to work with the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Council to, to explore all the various options and opportunities that are available to indie theater makers. Thank you. Thank you uh, all. And, um, you know, I just want to say a, a couple of things to uh, uh, to lit, who I think, um, in my mind, are among the most uh, politically engaged uh, uh, arts uh, organizations and collectives, in the sense that that you you do have these forums and questionnaires, and and uh, uh, and I'm and you mentioned council uh, members, which is great. Uh, you didn't mention mayoral or other things, but I think it's important. Uh, and I'm sure you are doing that also, right? Because, uh, and what made me think of that is that what everyone here is saying is, should not be considered radical, but, but to many people, what, what you all are proposing is radical, right? Because it's such a dramatic shift from where we are now and where we have been. Um, and the only way to make it less radical is to elect more people who actually don't think it's radical, who think that all of these changes are long overdue and have to happen. And, um, and then it's not so radical anymore, right? Because some of these, virtually all of these discussions have happened um, behind the scenes um, only for many people uh, to say that's completely unrealistic, that's completely uh, uh, not doable, that's completely too radical, right? Um, and you need critical mass inside um, to actually be able to uh, change or such critical mass outside that people are forced uh, to do things. Um, so I just wanna make sure because the power of the mayor is great uh, and, and can, um, if we have, uh, a mayor who cares deeply about the arts and arts organizations. Um, and, and I mean, like grassroots, like arts organizations, right? Um, uh, because we, in my 11 years, um, have either not had uh, that kind of leadership from the mayor or had a mayor who was, who, who liked the arts, but the elite, um, uh, in the art world, right, um, primarily. So either way, we haven't had what we desperately need, right, which is people focused on this community, right? Um, and and that's, that's yet to happen. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say um, all of those things. And I believe Council Member Diaz uh, has a, a question. So I wanna call on Council Member Dharma Diaz. No, it's actually, it's not a question. It's more of a comment, if I may. I, I just want to sh um, share with you the gratitude for this experience today and share with you that I am committed as my colleagues are, are sharing that they're reaching their tenure, I'm coming in 
as a member and, and excited to bring in my vision for art and, and culture. Part of my plan is to bring in a multifaceted museum in, into the district as an av as a, as a education advocate. One of the most recent schools built in, the, in, my, in my community is equipped for a theater and art space. So I just know that I'm, as I, as I said, as, as some of you are transitioning, I, I welcome the opportunity to engage further with those that are speaking today. I'm about deliverables and, and I wanna continue um, as you phase off to, you know, I want you to pass the baton to me, you know, cause it's about deliverables. You know, uh, in junior high school, Mr. Shore was my drama teacher who's not no longer with us. And I love to see his vision move forward and live on. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, Diaz, and yes, it is uh, awfully um, good to hear that we have uh, council members uh, beyond the majority leader and myself who care uh, about uh, this community and will fight for it. Uh, with that, uh, let me ask the council to call the last panel. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. So we are calling the final panel. And again, uh, we will call for any witnesses that we inadvertently missed um, at the end of this panel. The last members um, to testify on this panel, there are only two, again, we will call others um, if we missed anyone, Ryan Gillum from Fourth Arts Block and Olympia Kazi. Uh, uh, thank you. And um, Ryan Gillum, you may begin when the Sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Gillum from Fourth Arts Block. Um, I've been a working artist and arts educator for four decades in the Lower East Side. I'm also a co-founder and currently the executive director of FAB. Uh, I wanna to respond to the real estate study proposal by sharing a few things we've learned on East Fourth Street. So FAB was founded 20 years ago as an anti-displacement initiative by a coalition of artists and community leaders in order to prevent the eviction of cultural groups from city owned buildings on East 4th Street between 2nd Avenue and Bower. We organized successfully and eight properties were transferred to local groups for $1 each. The new owners were mostly small organizations with budgets of 250,000 or less, two thirds of them led by artists of color. Ownership has transformed our organizations. I believe some of the core principles that made possible success on 4th Street were that equity was built in from the beginning, that we were both a cluster and a collaboration, which is particularly critical for sustaining smaller organizations, and that we were active and deeply connected to our neighborhood. I also wanna make one recommendation today to the city, which is to build out and make better use of what already exists. An example, FAB's dance block program was created because rehearsal studios on our block were going unused during weekday hours. Studio owners didn't have the capacity to manage a robust rental program, so FAB raised funds to staff and subsidize the program. Dance Block operates now in five studios and three buildings and serves more than 400 choreographers a year with $10 an hour rehearsal space. We need to keep looking at what resources exist within the field and how they might be better used to support artists. And finally, if we want the city to take a bigger role in arts and culture, we need more capacity at DCLA. We need an agency that is truly empowered and has the resources to make real change happen. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. The final panelist and the final witness for this hearing, again, we will check for anyone we inadvertently missed, will be Olympia Kazi. Thank you. I'm Can you hear me? Can you yeah. hear me? We, we can hear you, thank you. And you can begin when the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And my name is Olympia Kazi. I'm a founding member of the New York City Artists Coalition and the Music Workers Alliance. And I've been working with so many of you on this call. It feels like, <laughs> you know, gathering back. 
So uh, I want to talk about the two legislations that are proposed today, but I also want to make sure that our elected officials don't feel that they're off the hook. You guys have a few more months and you can pass legislation. So let's be honest. <laughs> what is happening around real estate? We know it's rent. Everybody told you it's rent, it's rent, it's rent. And there is intro 1796 about commercial rent stabilization. It already has 12 co-sponsors. Uh, it used to have 13 because Rafael Espinal moved. No, so now the council member Diaz, it's crazy that you are here because you need to become a co-sponsor again. And we need to pass commercial rent stabilization because guess what? Art spaces are commercial tenants. And for the people that are being harassed in Crown Heights, they should be aware that there is a commercial tenant harassment legislation and that they can access commercial assistance and they can go against the landlord that has been harassing them. So I feel that it is very important in this moment of crisis that you pass progressive legislation and you enact progressive policies. So you asked from, you heard from Ryan, community land trust work. So that's what you should be uh, investing in right now, the city, the DCLA. That's what we need to be doing right now in this crisis, there's gonna be a lot of real estate that is gonna default and it should not go to predatory investors. It should be taken by the city and reformed into community land trusts and given to communities, artists and others who need it. I believe we need universal solutions for issues like rent, healthcare, housing. These are things that are not artists alone. And then we need some things that should be only for artists and art communities communities. And so, and, but then that is not an idea. I feel that is a misguided idea. I know that idea feels like a good thing to have at a Time certain point, expired. but as someone who also serves at land use and zoning from my community board and has seen what is happening in Soho with that area that was supposed to have I did artists, it is really a Pandora box. So I feel we should first, as, as actually the commissioner suggested, come up, what are, what are the services that we want to give? What are the infrastructure that artists need that is, you know, artist specific? We're not talking about housing and, and other issues that we feel as a community, as a society, we should address in an affordability crisis. Crisis. but uh, but we should avoid the trap that that would be and my last thing it's just because you know I have so many ideas and you all know me you heard it before and I'm gonna even submit written testimony but basically WPA is what we need right now because we do have a super majority at the state we got the senate and the thing is some sort of enhanced unemployment will be happening. Eventually, the governor will need to act on rent relief because we need to have uh, something. But what we do not have yet, and you should be using the federal aid money that we'll get at the city level, is to put artists back to work and art spaces capable of producing new work because it's going to be three to five years from what we hear in studies before the city can restart its economy. And so we cannot afford for three to five years artists to be hand to mouth and just have unemployment to pay the rent. We need new works produced. And that's why we implore you to do WPA style kind of uh, ideas moving forward. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Olympia, um, who uh, always comes in with such energy and passion uh, and, and good ideas. Um, I just want to say a few things. Number one, uh, I am one of those co-sponsors of commercial rent control and uh, very much uh, believe in, in that, um, as well as the Small Business Job Survival Act and, and all of those pieces of legislation that um, too few people are supporting, right? Um, and, and that is a problem. I, I do want to talk to uh, DCLA capacity, which someone uh, raised, and that is really important, right? Because I have had a front row seat um, to uh, three commissioners um, now and, and two mayors, uh, you know, and, and everyone knows uh, uh, I have a, a long time personal friendship with uh, Gonzalo Casales and believe him uh, to be amazing. I, I had uh, uh, um, Great respect uh, for Tom Finkelpearl um, and um, and uh, uh, Kate uh, before um, uh, him, but uh, but we need an empowered uh, DCLA. Uh, we need a well-resourced DLA, uh, a DCLA. We need the DCLA commissioner uh, to have access to the mayor. Um, and and to have the support of the mayor and um, 
and and because all the best intentions, uh, you know, can be stopped if if there's no access, there's no resources, and there's no power. And I'm not saying um, that that that's uh, uh, the situation uh, we find ourselves completely, but I do believe that. Commissioner Casals uh, and the DCLA uh, need more resources um, and uh, would be able to do more with that. Um, and, and we definitely need uh, whoever the next mayor of the city of New York is going to be uh, to uh, empower this agency uh, to truly meet the needs of this community. And, and that is a really big deal. Um, and, and we just have not had had that we've done some good things, but we just haven't had, um, you know, a, a mayor who's truly driven by this and who who is uh, uh, um, truly truly engaged. And and so that is absolutely uh, imperative. Um, and uh, Olympia, I, I'm with you on on the CLTs as well. Um, again, like I said, you know, we are still in a place uh, which is crazy that so many of these proposals are considered radical um, and, and we have got to fundamentally shift um, where government is at and, and shift the balance of power, right? Uh, away from uh, landlords and real estate, um, which is uh, where everything is so centered um, still today. Uh, and that has horrific consequences uh, for everyone here, uh, but also uh, <laughs> millions and millions of people beyond uh, this call. So, so thank you uh, to all of you um, for being here today. Um, I think the council will, will make a, a last call to see if we've missed anyone, if anyone else uh, has yet to testify. Um, but um, I think this was a good first discussion on the two pieces of legislation. Um, and uh, um, I get the urgency of the moment, trust me. Uh, I know that this is not um, a time for small and slow measures, um, but so much power rests in the governor's hands, um, as everyone here knows. Um, with COVID, uh, he has even more power <laughs> um, than he ever did. Uh, right there was a consolidation of power early in the pandemic, uh, and as long as we still have emergency orders, the governor has even more outsized power. Uh, and, uh, and obviously the, the mayor uh, has a lot uh, to say about these things as well. So, um, but we will keep fighting. Um, so with that, uh, let me just uh, throw it back to the council and thank all of you uh, for being in this fight. Thank you so much, Chair Van Bramer. Um, and as the chair mentioned, at this point, we have concluded public testimony. So uh, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please at this time, use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. So we are watching the panelists. We are not seeing any hands. So one last call for anybody that we inadvertently missed. Chair, I do not see any hands raised. Um, so at this point, if this does not change right now, we've concluded public testimony for this hearing. Great, thank you uh, very much, uh, Brenda. Um, you're always so thorough in that last portion, making sure that we have not missed anyone. Um, uh, and I do wish, uh, that it will happen soon enough that we resume these hearings um, at City Hall and uh, we can actually see uh, some of the folks um, on this call again in person. Um, I also just want to say that while my term ends on December 31st, um, I am not done and still very much here as a fighter for this community uh, for the duration of my time as a council member and whatever comes uh, in, in the future. Uh, I am one of you and will always be uh, one with you in the fight. So um, thank you uh, for everything you do uh, and bring to this hearing and to this city. And with that, uh, unless Brenda tells me uh, I shouldn't, 
I will adjourn the hearing. And Cheryl, I have not forgotten about the happy birthday wish to my mother. Uh, I have your um, uh, personal information and I will be texting you and we will work that out uh, offline. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.